Thank you very much for um, sharing this evening with us and uh, giving us some of your invaluable personal time. You're going to know what I'm going to talk about. Now, I could do two things. I can control you, or I can give you a choice. Control the choice. Choice, control. <laughs> I'm going to be human. I'm going to give you a choice. Hopefully, we're going to share together what I see are nine influential factors that will affect dramatically the outcome of business effectiveness. There are nine factors. Life. What do I mean by life in the life of work? We could all say what our view of the, what's the meaning of life. I'm not going to be so presumptuous to give you my version, but I'm going to give you somebody else's that I think is absolutely fantastic, and it's the context of what I mean by the life of work, and here it cometh. Unfortunately, he's no longer with us, but a, an American writer called Joseph Campbell came up with the following quotation. Life has no meaning. Each of us has meaning, and we bring it to life. It is a waste to be asking the question when we is the answer. We are life. And that's it. And we are extraordinary people and beings. So, we've understood here what life is. So, what about the other one, work? Now, I didn't get English language at school. So really, I don't do well when I'm looking at words that are more than two syllables. So this is great for me, work, one syllable. And as you can maybe see here, you know, I don't do sort of words. I kind of do th things in drawings and cartoons. I, I, I'm much, much more comfortable doing communication with that medium. And here we have the self-portrait of a young man. <clears throat> it is no longer. Um, and um, we've got something extraordinary going on, you know, it's a balancing act of aspects that we're doing. We're thinking, seeing, doing, and connecting. That's the essence of what kind of work is, and I'll come to that a bit later. There's also aspects that we want rest from doing these things, and also aspects of playfulness. Because if we don't get restoration and fun, some of that is essential for some of our personalities to rejuvenate us, to be thinking, seeing, doing, and connecting again. But there's something else on the old drawing there, and there's aspects here that disturb us greatly and impact on what we're really trying to do, which is concentration. So we're juggling all these sorts of things. When do I do thinking, seeing, and doing, connecting? And is someone forcing me to do one or the other when I prefer to do one of the other aspects? And there's something, you know, somebody's whistling or somebody's eating gum, you know. It, it just can't, these can be extraordinary things that will disturb my best work. And if that's not all, we're trying to do these sorts of things in something called habitat. That's a very particular word put on there. Habitat is something extraordinary, and it's made of all sorts of things. And we'll talk about that in a little bit while. So each of these factors have a vertical and a horizontal orientation. This, not surprisingly, will influence the nature of these factors and the influence on a positive or negative aspect on the business effectiveness. We have choice and restriction. We have variety and we have limitation. So ones can be positive, ones can be negative. However, if a chairman or a department or team leader feels that in order to res restrict something of how people go about working, and that's the way to be much more efficient or effective for their department, they have the right to do so. And it's whether the alignment of the individuals or the team members are happy to be under that kind of influence. If they are, and there's synchronicity, that's absolutely fine. If they're not, 
no good will come of it. So the longevity and ease of introducing change needs to be understood. So really, to, to undertake change, particularly into 21st century and with all sorts of products that create office environments, it's pretty straight, it's a no-brainer. If you've got the right specifiers and they're designing the right intelligent products for the performance criteria that's been very well researched to support the needs of individuals and teams, it's absolutely, you know, not in doubt. It's easy peasy, lemon squeezy. What is more difficult is to change process, strategies, and good stuff like that. Why is that a little bit more difficult? He, it's because people are involved more in that kind of good stuff than in workplace transformation. It's this sort of stuff, the process, that gets to people's emotions. So. It's the whole aspect of change upon people, whether they're teams, departments, or organizations. That is the most profoundly difficult aspect to undertake change. And it will always will be. Business effectiveness is particularly about how well and quickly innovativeness surfaces and is executed. So. Innovation is the number two factor that influences business effectiveness. The top 50 of the 500 organizations in the 14500 have been surveyed and say innovation is critically key for growth and survival for business organizations. They say it's the main factor that differentiates themselves from their competition. It's the most influential aspect that gets them out of the circumstances that they find themselves in. But it's not enough. What has to be in place is a vehicle to control that innovation. There has to be discipline about it. The journey from the catalyst of need to transform or change has been struck in someone's noodle bumps to achieve some form of innovation. And there's a journey of transformation between the two that we know, don't we, that's not as straightforward as anybody likes and desires. It, for some, it goes backwards before it can go forwards. But there's something that influences the quality, the wellness of that entire magical journey and it is culture culture is the emotive heart that will determine from the catalyst to the innovativeness whether that innovativeness has been worthwhile in the investment and the aim that was um, asked for it to be discovered culture that's the third one of importance and there's two ways of looking at culture. There's many ways, but you're only going to get two from me this evening. One is organizational culture, and the other is self-culture. There needs to be a framework for identifying exactly what is organizational culture all about. There are frameworks, methodologies in place and available. We pride ourselves in supporting one, and this is, I will explain it to you very briefly. Culture number one is very much a creative type culture. It's called create. And people in that kind of culture are besotted with being the first to do every innovative thought that's ever been done before. They're passionate about it. They're creatives. The next one is called control very much about a hierarchical leadership mentality, about doing things only the proven right way. And they're often doing work that's very individually orientated rather than working in groups and teams. So here's the first two. It's very clear that both these cultures are in complete tension and opposite values. That's why the framework's called competing values. 
And the other pair are these, compete, the competitive culture. Like sales and marketing departments, they're so emotional and excitable beings and can be quite noisy of all these kind of cultures, you know. Just think of sales and marketing people, you know, and the goals that they've got to achieve and the pressure that, that they is under. They're very much about doing things very, very quickly in short term. Opposite to them are the collaborate culture, very akin to family. Just do everything and everything together. If they want to choose a leader for next year's, you know, whatever it might be, they'll all get together, you know, and they'll get the pizzas in and they'll talk and talk and eat and talk, talk and eat and talk, talk you know, for as long as they get mutual consensus. These boys and girls ain't got the inclination or time to get into that mindset. So there we have it, our four competing value cultures. But when we look at them horizontally and compare them that way, or vertically, there's certain aspects which are a little bit more closer affinity to the culture. So the tension isn't so dramatic. So when an organization is looking at change and they want to be more collaborative, you know, we've heard that kind of word often, we've seen it read, generally speaking, they're in somewhere in this bottom area of culture as a dominant culture. And they kind of want to go into this sort of spirit. And it's often found in surveys and assessments that the dominant culture they're in is in control. And they want to morph themselves, shift themselves into being more up in this upper quadrant. There's a way we go and measure the emotional um, Put profile of this. We take the surveys, five, five ten minute surveys, answer six questions, and each answer, each question has four answers, and each of the answers relates to one of those four culture types. And funnily enough, the competing values framework, you could actually do this survey yourselves and determine what kind of profile mix your culture is, your personal culture preference, what's the most dominant and what's the secondary. What you won't get by doing the survey is looking at what might the design environment implications be for you. That's where we've worked with these guys to enrich as a platform of their methodology and apply it into the office place environment. So we undertake a current moment in time survey that can give us a profile. And this is just an example where we can see here often very typical of organizations entrenched in you know years and years of doing stuff the same way you know they're in the bottom half of this kind of diagram where the um, control and sometimes the compete cultures are very similar in domination the create culture just quickie here you'll see that there are 11 there's many more but there's 11 just the kind of start of a 10 workplace environment implications listed down in the corner it's important to look at culture in terms of space utilization as a pattern, as well as the typology or typography. Again, didn't get English, so I'm not quite, I know it begins with a T, but it's one of those ologies. Look at that pattern from the previous one, you know. Oops, a daisy. <laughs> Sorry, I pressed the wrong button. So, see that one there? Oop, oh, elephant and see that pattern there. One's organic and the other one is definitely not so. And why is that? You know, because this circulation up here, number one, and the boundary enclosure, which says intense height to medium high, reflects the fact that these people are predominantly individually working in their whole ethos and culture. The landscape here is heavily subdivided to offer degrees of concentration that's quite intensive. Here's the compete culture, the excitable sales and marketing teams. You know, the, the pretty pattern here is a little bit more like the control culture. Like I said, you know, that horizontal band is a bit more synergy and empathy 
between cultures. But it's a little bit more varied as the pattern. There's still the efficient main road here. And there's some group enclosed offices here. Um, so there's a signal of, yes, we are the leaders. We've earned the right, you know, and that's part of our culture. We, we're quite happy to know, you know who the leader is. But we're not too domineering as the other culture alongside us. But, you know, if we look at the landscape, we can see here the boundary for concentration that was intense before is not so intense. Well, it's obvious they don't necessarily need to have that sort of concentration at these sort of desk-based areas, but they do need it in their kind of huddle spaces, even for taking a little telephone call in the corridor. So they're not too disturbing people. They're trying to do some work just nearby. Here, actually, rather extraordinary. You know, you've got people who are nearly sitting on one another's laps. How on earth might they be doing good work there, says someone in the finance department? Well, they are, because they need that, because they're not in that workplace very often. They're not at assigned spaces. They've got some freedom in their work styles to be more agile. But when they're in their place of work, they connect with their counterparts that they don't see very often. And they're quite happy, actually, to be disturbed. They want to be seen to be there because sometimes they don't see one another for a while. So what's the point of any, any kind of boundaries of screening along there? Oh, yes, there is, actually. Mm, yeah, what, ooh, what, what, what for? Yeah, brand police. Beg pardon? Who are they? The Inquisition, in a manner of speaking, in a manner of speaking, of influence. They is what they're all about in enforcing the brand association of the organization that will proliferate sometimes when it gets very extreme into the landscape. You know, here we've got the sort of high street or little sort of neighborhood street, and we have a front door. And then we've got a back door, and that's the in and out kind of thing, just like a house. You know, so it's an extended family, this kind of ethos and values of the collaborate culture. This culture is strongest in providing settings to collaborate with. You know, standing up settings, high stalls, interactive technology, around a printer, you know, which can become a hub, and there's surfaces to write on and stalls to kind of perch upon. There's little tables close to some teams and a load of screenings to write on and display thinking. You, know, you won't find that emphasis in the opposite culture of compete. They ain't got time to, to spend on that, but they have got time to collaborate in their war room. And it's often a very central kind of place. Do you know what? Now, I'm going to be provocative now. It's not, un, not like me at all. I firmly believe that each of our self-cultures is more important than the culture of the organization that we work for. Business effectiveness will never, ever happen without our full engagement. And by that, I mean doing our fantastic work. Because if we don't do our fantastic work, that organization is going to fail. So getting to grips with our place in the team and in departments and how they react to us and how departments react to other departments and how the senior <coughs> management team gets out to reacting to me is absolutely vital before folk get into buying product to collaborate. We've got to understand and explore what are the ways we need to collaborate. And if we're looking at different culture types, even within self-cultures of departments, that is so complicated. And folk need to have advisors and those with knowledge to explore and guide, you know, to help inform conceptual design. Number six, work. This is all about think, see, do, connect, as I mentioned right at the start, five hours ago. Um, right, think. What do you mean by think? Think is all about sharing ideas with yourself, discussing, brainstorming. That's what think is all about. See, 
that's all about one or two people needing to transfer information to other people. Do, that's all about doing stuff, performing specific tasks in either physical isolation or with other people. And the last one is about connect, the need to have face-to-face -face conversations with people, often on a social basis. That's sort of essentially what work is about. And there are specific design implications to support group and individual think, see, do, connect. Here we've got a create, think environment for group. And it's important to consider that there does need to be an external aspect to the environment so that they can brain away in a distance and daydream and not be restricted with an emulsion wall. You know, they put their nose against. Or maybe there's something to do with a more higher aspect of, you know, reaching for the stars and the clouds to empty the mindset. Sometimes that posture can be done in a much more informal, lower lounging, softer behaviour. Or in fact, it might be more energetic when you're actually getting into energising and brainstorming. And it might be more as a stand-up activity and you've got various aids to help you communicate when you're teaming. And there might be some artifacts around just to help inspire you from work previously done. The C type environment, I say, is where one or two people really want to communicate information in more of a kind of controlled manner. So the environment needs to support that. Here we've got the, the area where the main visual point of information is, and here we have the um, orator controlling the meeting here. And we can see this is quite an informal space. These spaces don't always have to be in enclosed environments, or indeed formal in the traditional 30-metre boardroom table kind of thing. And that's been thoughtfully considered that way because the design consultant has understood who that particular leader is. He's more of a collaborate-type personality, about more informal rather than being so regimented and formalised. So, you know, he wants people to be a little bit more relaxed and a bit more sociable, but still wants their attention. So the ambience is enhanced by a sense of view outside, but it is not distracting the concentration of people there. Here we've got the do collaborative space, the do group space, which is a hive of energy, and you can see there's mixed media to help share attitudes and thoughts going on, from technology to post-its. There's bundles of project filing, and there's also a need to have some sort of aperture so that people outside the room are connected with what's going on there. We don't like secret squirrels, you know. We want to feel that we're apart, even though we're not you know, in the meeting ourselves. And the last one, connect. It's very much, as I say, you know, about f family spirit when we get into kind of, you know, informal conversation. So why doesn't, you know, the environment get designed a little bit more homely, a little bit more closer and personal? So why not look at the ceiling? And why does it have to be 2.85 metres absolutely everywhere and have the same functional utilitarian lighting? It doesn't do it any favours for the quality of engagement in that style of collaboration. So there's sensitivity, there's understanding who these people are, or is, sorry, and know the culture. We mustn't forget that Think, See, Do, Connect is undertaken by people individually. It's not you know, this emphasis of collaboration, it's not all about that. Don't forget that work has to be done individually and equally concentrating. But sort of above all, we've got to be very mindful that the environments must enhance the need for concentration. That's the highest aspect of people's problems, often in the workplace. They can't concentrate there, and that has been the excuse to go off home and concentrate. Right, number seven. A place to be is very important that influences business effectiveness. Why do you go to your favourite restaurants, your favourite cafes? Why do you go on that lovely coastal path walk that's a, you know, it, it's your absolute favourite and you can't look forward to it often enough? 
what do you feel when you're spending time in your favorite places? Do you ever remotely feel anything of the sort at your office environment? Where do you spend your time thinking in your office environment? When, if you're allocated a place on a bench, or um, a, a space in a corner, or maybe you're occupying a group enclosed office, or you may have an isolated enclosed room, are you doing your very best, or do you go somewhere else in the office? Why, when we have choice to create our environments and the use of colors, materials, and finishes, and choice of lighting specifications to get the ambience that resonates with who we is. Where we decide to go to these favorite places, we experience the taste, the service, the ambience, the joy of other people, or we're going into nature and experiencing what they can provide for us. What on earth happens here in the second place, the office place, that sometimes isn't as well considered. Well, it's pretty well a good idea in a way that there are some problems because that employs some of us here to help find out where the improvements need to be. Number eight, nearly there. Enrichment. This is absolutely vital to be in the workplace environment to influence greater business effectiveness. It's addressing our senses of sight, smell, taste, and hearing, and also touch. You know, what are these for? Not for scratching the hair that we've got left, you know. It's to experience the sensations at our fingertips, you know, going around a corridor and you see some bubbly fabric that's kind of very undulating, I just run my fingers along it. Or if there's corrugated iron and I'm going around a path, I try and find a twig and I make a noise. I get something from that. You know, what do we find that's lacking in our office environments? Pretty well. I'll tell you one for starters. Delight. That's so romantic delightfulness. Why on earth should you associate such a beautiful word, a very feminine word to me, with the place of work, for goodness sake? We certainly ought to do so. The last one is about ethos. This is really about whoever they is that decide our life work, whether we're going to have a life of presenteeism or empowerment and enrichment that can bring joy, discovery, exploration, excitement and sadness, but how wonderful is all of that? And it's about how they look at what we do, the tasks, how we're going to do those with our colleagues, well, one person, or just do it by ourselves, and the style we want to do this stuff. You may have a particular style for um, thinking, you know, differently than I will, you know. Um, and if you don't have the environment to enhance your preference, then you're going to be bothered by it, and you're going to, you're going to get that pressure imposed and we also want to know how, you know, how we, do we want to do this stuff? We want to know what kind of posture you know, is preference for you and what might be for me? And where we want to do it, what's going to be the best place to do what's being asked of us? And if we've got no choice in it, what does that make us feel and what does it do to what we've been asked? And the last one is about when we want to do it, and when we have to do it, you know, are you a night person, a night owl, 
or are you a morning person? I'm a morning person, you know, and it's just getting to the end of my... <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm coming down now, I think. Um, and if you're a night owl, you're going to, you know, your creativity is going to be a different time sink. You know, and if for one reason you've got to do some creative work in the workplace and use some fantastic technology, you can't do it at home, you can't do it in your favourite restaurant, you've got to do it at your place of work and it's not accessible 24 hours because they haven't recognised who you is. la di da di da di da Right. Hmm. Um, so, uh, thank you for your attention, um, and um, I've enjoyed this. And any questions, do come and see me or shout out now. Thank you.